Well, I define myself as, I guess, an artist. I mean, I'm using the medium of the theater to work out, to embody my concern with this problem of consciousness and collision with the world. So I guess I just say I'm as an artist. But I do think I'm a writer, even though I don't like to write anymore, because I think that I do the other, when I'm doing other elements of the staging of the production, I still feel like I'm rewriting. You know, I'm rewriting my texts by doing things on stage. The big task for me is to get free of that training that our families gave us, the institutions we live within give us, our society gives us, so that we are not just echoing the voices of the world that surround us, that invades us. It's very hard to get rid of those voices. It's certainly very hard for me, and I think it's hard for young actors, young creators, so that I think of contacting the unconscious, but, and I'm very interested in psychoanalysis and all kinds of disciplines, including spiritual disciplines, that try to get to some other level, some other reality. But it's very tricky to know whether that other level is just what's out there in the world, uh, pummeling us in our daily lives for all of our lives, or some other source. And I tend to think that the only way to get in touch with something that is, in a sense, very impersonal, you see, it isn't, it isn't a subjective sense of my own depth psychology that I'm interested in. People have called my theater solipsistic. I don't think it really is, because what I'm really trying to do is to erase all reference points and see what comes when you have erased all reference points. You know, there's a famous uh, psychoanalyst um, from England uh, who actually was Beckett's psychoanalyst, Wilfred Bayon. And uh, he talks about this completely unknowable other and how you have to lose all memory, lose all knowledge, in fact, to try to make contact with this other thing. Uh, and basically, I've tried to do that my whole life. I've tried to operate in terms of a kind of negative theology. You know, when people talk, in, in, in the olden days, when people talked about God, it was uh, the approach of negative theology that essentially was saying, you get to know God by knowing everything that he is not. God is not this, God is not this. And in the same way, uh, when I'm working, I try to return to the source of my own blindness and my own stupidity. Now, am I lying? Because I may be kidding myself, and I may be kidding other people. Because the fact of the matter is that at the same time, I am extremely well-read, and I uh, am extremely knowledgeable about the history of the world, the history of art in the world, the history of philosophy. So for me to say, oh, I want to return to my essential stupidity, does that mean something different than, for instance, a young person who hasn't been exposed to very much yet. Well, that's a tricky subject, and I don't know. Uh, I also know that for many years, I've said that I think I was a more advanced writer than a director. Because when I'm a writer, I can lie on my couch a lot of the day, read snatches of books from my very extensive library, write a few lines of dialogue that just seem to be coming out of the air. And I'm essentially creating from a position that is a very passive position. And I think from that passive position, things come. Things come through me that are not censored by the Richard that wants to get ahead in the world and wants to be admired by people. Now, when I become a director and start directing my own material or other people's material, then I've always had the feeling that I am not courageous enough to stand up in front of my cast and be baffled and be emptied by my own conscious lack of knowledge the way that I am when I'm writing. So to be a director, I become a total control freak. I become energized. 
I become a very dominant, friendly personality who's controlling everything and controlling every moment. And that's a different kind of energy. That kind of energy turns me on in the same way that if I have to give lectures or talk about my art, or even now, I can feel the adrenaline flowing through me to wake me up, to make me feel energized so that I can speak. However, in retrospect, after it's over, I don't trust that part of myself. I think that part of myself that gets energized by the contact I have with other people and the need that I have to be dynamic in my interaction with other people, I think that persona is, for me and for everybody else, a kind of corrupted persona, a kind of corrupted mask that stands between you and the world and that sort of blocks this other energy that we're talking about from coming in and making a slight twitch, a slight pulsation inside of you somewhere that is the real material, that pulsation, that I think has to be the center of one's art and has to be the, the, the source, the well from which from which one really must drink if you don't end up uh, dying of thirst, dying of spiritual thirst. So these words, uh, imagination, creativity, that's sort of a semantic issue. All, all that I think I know is that you have to go to some place where you know nothing to let something else get through. Well, you know, I've gone through uh, an evolution. Originally, I went to the Yale Drama School. I graduated back in 1962. At the Yale Drama School, I was taught to write plays like Ibsen. You start with an outline, and you write, and you rewrite. Uh, pretty early on, I came under the influence of what were known as the underground filmmakers in New York City. I got involved with that group. And having been exposed to a different kind of art that didn't have the kind of scholastic heavyweight orientation that I had, started loosening me up. And I remember coming back to my apartment one day. I was trying to write plays. I was imitating Bresch. I was imitating Giraudoux, whatever you have. Uh, I came back to my apartment. I said, wait a minute, Richard. This is ridiculous. If you walked into a theater tonight, what would you really like to see happening? And I sat there at my table and closed my eyes for about 10 seconds, and I had this image of two people looking at each other on, across the stage, not moving, not talking, and there was something about the energy that I saw that I just wanted the theater to be like that, that potential energy. Here I am, I'm sitting at my desk, seeing these people staring at each other, it's a kind of stasis of pure potential. And I started at that point writing a kind of play that essentially imagined people sitting in chairs or standing awkwardly like I am now. I mean, I'm sitting here, and uh, the plays were just little tiny bits of very primitive dialogue, like, uh, my hand is on the armrest. Why is my hand moving? No, it's not moving. Okay, three lines like that. <laughs> and then there would be a loud boom, and maybe a bit of a pause, maybe I'd change my position or one of the other performers, and another three lines, all of which were in a very primitive sense, registering what was going on in the body, uh, and one's very simple, primitive response to that. It was as if I was trying to begin again from the very roots of the, what could make being present on stage the event. Well, I did that for a couple of years. And then uh, I started wanting something more complex, and the language got more involved, the language got more aphoristic, uh, and the plays started getting denser and denser. And the sound, which uh, was always echoed by the lines coming over loudspeakers, uh, we got to a point where different words of each line were coming from different speakers surrounding the audience. So the audience was sitting in this sea of language circulating it. 
the actors on stage repeating the language at a different tempo, uh, it was still written from this position of trying always to be in the present and registering what was happening in the present, in the body. And the staging of the plays dealt with, here we are in the present, the actors stared at the audience a lot. There were strange prompts that would interfere with the actors trying to carry out their tasks. In other words, if I sat on a chair, the chair might have one leg that was too short, so the chair would be hard to sit in, and the language would reflect upon that. So the and uh, objects became more and more profuse on stage, and I found myself writing mostly about the characters' interactions with objects that stood between them and other people, and the psychological tension bugged around that. Then I stopped using, uh, then the actors at that point became might, even though we were in small theaters, I didn't want this feeling of theater where people project and talk to the world. I wanted a very intimate tone. So in a small theater, people would talk into the mics. There would be overlays of voices and music on the tape. Then at a certain point, um, the language got very complex, very aphoristic, uh, very, very flashy. I sort of almost wanted to prove to people that I could write because for the first uh, 15 years of my theater, people, after a while, started liking it, but they said, well, he's a pretty interesting director, but of course those texts could be anything. So I wanted to prove that I could write, and I think I did. I wrote plays, and I got recognition in various ways as a writer. And I must say that for the last uh, three years, all of a sudden, writing, in a sense, has worn out for me. While there is speech, and speech is still the center of my theater, instead of aphoristic discourses, I'm now trying, to, I'm limiting myself to a few sort of simple-minded phrases that are repeated on tape in different ways, like mantras, like oracular statements. And the actors will talk a little bit against that, but the center is language, a statement that is as if dropped to the bottom of a well where it hits, the statement hits and reverberates. And the staging is trying to deal with that reverberation of simple, repeated phrases. I think that uh, in the West, I, I mean, I have mixed feelings about what this all means. Uh, for me, for a lot of literature also, uh, I found it very, I've always found it difficult to read novels, for instance. Uh, I've read poetry, I read a lot of uh, nonfiction, philosophy, psychoanalysis, aesthetics. But for me, discursive language at this moment in the West has sort of worn out. I can no longer believe in stating a complex psychological idea, philosophical idea, complex interaction between people with dialogue in which people are trying to manipulate each other. For some reason, that doesn't work for me in my own work anymore or in work that I see. It may change. It may change. At a certain point, I thought it was the only honest thing to do was to not to change anything I had written. Yeah, that writing was the evidence of my spiritual state uh, at the moment that I was writing. For the last 10 years, forget it, I change completely. When in rehearsal, I rewrite and rewrite. Before we go into rehearsal these days, I rewrite. I'm listening to the music I'm going to use. I'm imagining the actors I'm going to use. I do a great deal of rewriting. So it's just changed completely. Uh, and, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about that also. But I have mixed feelings about most things. I think it's possible that when one rewrites, one tends to socialize one, one's writing, take off the rough edges, uh, you know, make it understandable, make it seem like better literature, and I'm not sure that, that is healthy. I'm not sure that's what the world needs. I'm not sure that that doesn't take away from that initial flash of lightning, which might be a phrase coming to you, might be a series of words coming to you. But it's, I've changed. <laughs> 
do, you have to be very careful in rewriting. And oftentimes, I will rewrite and think that I have made and discover I've made it too smooth and made it too much like everything else. And that's a great danger for any artist, especially in the theater. There's a built-in corruption in the theater. You are not, as a painter is, making something and hoping one person will respond. You have a group of people there, and you try, I try, to fight being influenced by that group of people. Uh, most people will say, oh, that's the theater. You learn from your audiences. You learn about the response of the audiences. I say that's garbage, that uh, people en masse turn into Nazis, you know? <laughs> people, I do not trust group responses in any way. I think it levels everything out, produces the lowest common denominator. I think every individual member of my audience is basically more alive, more alert, alone, me talking to them, than when they get to be in a group. Now, I used to observe in the, oh, you know, 15 years ago, sometimes there would be a line that would come through. I wouldn't rewrite, but I'd say this one line, seems so corny, so embarrassing to me, that I'm going to break my rule, I'm going to cut it. And we would rehearse, and a week later, needless to say, oh, I would so miss that line, and I would realize that that line that embarrassed me was the seed that held the real energy of the scene, and I had to put it back in. It's strange, because as I say, language is sort of worn out for me. So, I don't write much anymore. Sometimes I just write uh, a sentence or a fragment. And I think, well, I'm 66. How many more plays will I get to do? I've got a lot of material I've never done that maybe I can go back to and arrange things. And then I notice that my notebook, oh, much to my surprise, look, there are 30 pages filled up. Where, how did that happen? All I was doing was scratching out little notes. So I type up those 30 pages. And in that very rough form, somehow it vibrates with a kind of life. I think, well, maybe these 30 pages could be a play. So I print them up, and I put them in a folder. Then, a couple of months later, I may go back, and I think, oh, boy, this needs a lot of work. But there's sections of it maybe I could put into the play this year. Or maybe it could be combined with something I wrote two years ago. So in a sense, I don't find myself sitting down and writing extended things anymore. What I find myself doing is scratching, and scratching on the page. And then, going back, it's as if my work as a writer now is to skim the cream off the top of what I have deposited upon the page. You know, I had an interesting discussion years ago when I used to work in Paris. I was quite friendly with Marguerite de Ross, who I respect greatly as a writer. And I remember being at dinner once, and Marguerite, for some reason, said, oh, you know, there's painting and so forth, but I think that the root is the word, the sentence. And I said, oh, I don't know. I think the root, the basic root, is the mark, like the caveman scratched on the wall, or people scratched on a stick. And the mark is the root. And I think I've reached a point where my writing is almost like just making marks, making a scratch on the page. You know, there's a famous um, analysis by Derrida about uh, one of Nietzsche's notebooks. He's talking about different things, and then there's the phrase, don't forget the umbrella. And nobody can figure out, does that really mean anything? Does it have any significance? And he wrote a whole big thing about don't forget the umbrella. I hope I'm quoting correctly or something about the umbrella. And in a sense, yes, or Joyce, when uh, he was dictating Finnegan's Wake to Beckett, and the doorbell rang, and he said, uh, go to the door. And that got into Finnegan's Wake, you know. And in a sense, I'm doing the same kind of thing. I'm letting all of that just be there, and then as a director, as a shaper, using that second part of the brain, being the psychoanalyst who is analyzing the patient who spewed out this stuff, then I'm organizing it, trying to make a shape out of it. And I'm still doing that, of course. But I'm skimming, I'm skimming the rich surface of this brew that comes out of me. And the reason I love Von Doderer, his books read like almost gossip columns. And then every third page, all of a sudden, it's like somebody opens a window and they'll be talking about this cocktail party that people went to and what's happening. At the same time, the light is coming through the trees and something is happening that's more cosmic and the wind is blowing in from the Hungarian plains. And, uh, you know. So it's a combination of this because Von Doderer was trained as a historian, 
and it's these two possibilities intersecting. So yes. <laughs>
visual arts come very easy to me. In other words, people think of my theater as being very visual. I don't even have to think about it. I just, I realize it has sort of um, relationship to sort of schizophrenic art. <laughs> I mean, it's cluttered. There's not a free inch that is not decorated, much like schizophrenic artists. Uh, and perhaps that means I'm schizophrenic. But uh, I have been at different times influenced by and interested in practically any visual artist you can name from any period. I just I don't know how to speak more exactly than that because uh, I am profoundly aware of painting, especially, and I think I'm very sophisticated. Uh, artist friends of mine have told me I'm very sophisticated in noticing things and picking up things in the visual arts. No, no, only costumes. Uh, everything else I designed from scratch. Well, I have them all that I'm doing next year inside. And they're very sloppy, but they're alive. For the first six years that I made theater, I was working at Jonas Mikas' underground film theater, and he would give me the theater, and I would go in there, and for two or three months, I, all by myself, would build the set. I'm too old to do that now, but yeah, I used to do that. Nice. And even today, I really don't do that much physical work. But when the set is up, you know, they were always making changes. And we have a lot of helpers, a lot of interns who do most of it. Sometimes I'll still paint a little something at the last minute to add something, but not too much. Again, if I wasn't able to provide some funding and not take a salary, and if we didn't have a dozen to 16 interns every year who do most of the work, we couldn't, we couldn't do it. Well, I'm, a, I'm the kind of per I'm a, I was a very shy young kid. I never even got up and danced on the dance floor and, until I was doing Three Penny Opera and I had these stars and I had to do a dance for the Three Penny Opera and I got up. I showed them how to do the dance. I had swear to you, I had never even had the courage to go out and get up and do social dancing in a disco or anything like that up till that point. Uh, it just comes. I don't know. I really can't answer that question. Uh, there are certain choreographers that have been important to me when I was 15. Martha Graham was a great revelation. And the American choreographer uh, Yvonne Rayner. But I haven't followed modern dance that closely. I just... Uh, find it easy to do my little thing. But I do think that somehow I'm very good at it. And I, I'm not good at first. I keep trying things, and I'm very open to try things. Ernest Hemingway said, what the artist really needs is a good built-in shit detector. And I think <laughs> I have a very good shit detector. Because anybody who's ever worked for me will say it's amazing. All the wonderful things that I create in rehearsal seem wonderful to them. And then I throw them out because it's not, for me, it's not good enough. Uh, after two days, it's worn out for me. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Try it. Try it differently. And I just am willing to try it differently. Anything I can think of. And then I recognize, ah, that's it. Now, I think that if I have any talent, it is a talent for sensing, as I've spoken about many times in this interview, this underlying unarticulatable, continual eruption of new things from different directions that are constantly bombarding you, sensing that and sensing a rhythm, sensing uh, a, a responsiveness to this fact that the world is constantly knocking us around with atoms of thoughts, words, gestures, light, ideas that we can't see consciously. We can scan it, we're aware of it on some other level, and I think I'm responsive to that other level somehow. But I don't think of mental concepts, in other words, I'm never thinking philosophy, for instance, when I'm working. I'm never thinking, oh, this is the latest structuralist idea, how can I express that in mm. mental life? Never, never, never. It's more like Zen training. You know, the, the Zen painter will study, study, study everything until it's totally unconscious inside of him, then he picks up the brush and <laughs> there it is in two seconds. But that two seconds is a result of regurgitating and regurgitating certain themes for a whole life. 
Well, I have been regurgitating and regurgitating all kinds of themes, and I think they've seeped in, so they operate through me in a different way without thinking about it. And I can't even bring myself to exercise. I used to cheat to get out of gym class. What feeds my ego the most is all these people from different areas tell me, like uh, oh, choreographers, Yvonne Rain or Carol Armitage, say, oh, Richard, you're one of the great choreographers. Uh, Phil Glass, uh, you know, Richard, you're one of the great, uh, John Zorn, you're one of the great composers. <laughs> it's all in the context of my own work, of course. But yes, I think I, in, the, in my own little world, I've created a world of planet, form and planet. And in form and planet, I can do all of those things. <laughs>
I make it more complex. People come to my shows and say, oh, there's so much going on. I mean, we miss it all. It goes by us. It's too complex. I say, yeah, I realize you probably can't get it all at once. But I have to assume that on an unconscious level, you are picking up the richness of the brew. And that's what's exciting. Uh, because I am making it to make attention here in my solar plexus when I watch it. Then I know it's okay. Then I know it's not stupid. My theater, for me, works as follows in terms of its relation to the audience. You know how they have, in the 19th century at least, I don't know if they still have it, there's a children's top that you can pump and it spins around. And on the side, there may be little pictures called the Goose story or something. Now, you look at the top as an object and you say, oh, look at that story. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested when you start to make the top go around. The woo and the blur of that energy is fascinating. And I want to make a play which, yeah, maybe you can't follow all the little elements of the story, but you're just fascinated by the blur of this controlled, carefully articulated energy. On one level, the structure is like jazz, with theme and variations. My plays always have hmm, sort of basic themes which then uh, I am inventing ways to reflect that theme with different objects, uh, from different perspectives. It's sort of hard to talk about, of course. But it is theme, jazz's theme and variations. Now, everything is overdetermined. At the same time, it's as if uh, a patient were on a couch with a psychiatrist. The patient is making these associations, these free associations. And pretty soon you start to see, no, there are certain thematic centers. And some analysts might start to direct the patient so that he sees that, well, yes, but everything somehow is relating to the way his mother treated him. Right? So I, as a director, am sort of organizing things so that the, uh, the attractor, the magnetic attractor of certain central ideas seems to be operating. Um, it's also a kind of structure in which, given the basic theme, you show things not necessarily serving that theme, but interfering with that theme. When I worked for Joe Papp, for instance, who was a big American producer who I loved, had a different aesthetic than I did, but we got along very well together. His notion, as most people in the conventional theater would say, well, you have to try to figure out what you're trying to say and eliminate all distractions and key in, make everything serve that river flowing into the ocean. At a certain point, I realized that what I was really interested in was at every moment, not getting rid of the distractions, not getting rid of things that might suggest other possibilities, but showing that increasing web of possibilities, and somehow making a structure that alternatives are co-present on the stage. You don't have to decide, oh, in my interpretation, Hamlet is like that because of the way he was treated by his mother. Or somebody else might say, my interpretation, Hamlet is like that because of the social realities of uh, Elizabethan England or Denmark in that period. No, I want all of those things to be co-present. That's not normal theatrical stru structure. It is more akin to what Gertrude Stein, great American writer who wrote a lot of plays, that people are now only starting to figure out how to do. She said, my plays are like landscapes. You wander through the landscape. There are all kinds of different ways of talking about this kind of structure. Or contemporary, uh, Deleuze, French philosopher, talking about the st rhizome structure of the way roots are connected underneath the ground rather than a tree structure which there's a central theme, there are branches. No, everything is connected to everything else. That's my structure. I want everybody, I, I like to work in a small theater, so I feel everybody is seeing basically what I see. But I want the audience and I know nobody does this, and maybe I don't even do it. 
but I want them to be aware of the whole frame at all times because I will direct an actor over here to do something, I will direct certain people over here to do something at the same time, and it is the whole composition that is important to me that I slave over, not just identifying with what this person who seems to be the focus at that moment is doing. It is how that plays off against an adjustment of somebody standing over here. So that's what ideally uh, I like. Now in my little theater, a lot of the people are too close to really do that. But that's what I'm thinking in all of that. No. Sometimes. I want to direct the audience's attention to follow certain things sometimes. But at the same time, I'd like to have the feeling that they're sitting there with a kind of wide-angle view and are always aware of all things that are happening. I know that's a dream, but uh, th that's the way I'd like to think of it. Like everything in the world, and I've had to obviously answer this question millions of times, and there are about there are many different answers because everything is overdetermined. One answer is that it's like you see an artist sketching, and there are a lot of extra lines that just are the energy of the artist filling the composition. Here's the head. Giacometti is drawing a head. Here's the head, but then there are a lot of other lines coming in, making it all lively. That's one answer that does that. Also, it's often between the actors and the audience, creating a kind of aesthetic distance, kind of separation. Also, it defines areas so that it's like everything is graphed. So you see what is happening in all parts of the stage against the graph of those lines, almost like a scientific graph, and you're charting those movements. But also, on a more psychological level, when I was um, 13, 14, I had uh, some dreams. Actually, they were about the atomic bomb in those days. But two things, two specific images from those dreams. Going up the stairs in my house, my father looking down at me with a big swollen head with crossed eyes and very powerful eyes coming at me. And very soon after that, dreaming that I was coming out of an uh, excavation in the ground. There was an airplane flying above, people looking out of the airplane down at me between those people's eyes and me came dotted lines. Uh, the early theater that I made involved the actors staring at the audience a lot of the time. And I think it came from something that was the same as the source of those dreams. Because when I was first married to my first wife, for many years, I'm not exaggerating, Oh, at least four or five times a week, I would have a terrible nightmare where I would scream and I would wake the people upstairs. And the content of that dream was always, in different ways, me rounding a corner, somebody else coming into the room, but somebody all of a sudden looking at me and staring with this intense gaze that would make me scream in terror. Mm -hmm. And I relate that not only to the staring at the audience in my plays, but somehow to these dotted lines, which indicate some kind of lines of force that suggest other ways to read things. Often in the early plays, I would have a dotted line carried, not to the main part of the action, but to one of these peripheral things that seemingly had nothing to do with the action, but just to suggest, no, the composition can be cut up in different ways. No, your attention can be manipulated in different ways. So it's all of these things and probably more all together. And finally, that's, that's nothing is ever final, I'm remembering that when I was a young man of about 15, I saw some pictures of Bertolt Brecht's productions. And he had that wire across the stage that he often has where a curtain is drawn. And for some reason, that wire across the middle of the stage, seemingly for no reason, even though I knew the curtain was being drawn, just provided an energy, a theatricalist energy that was terribly exciting to me. So that was another influence. I tell the actors to invent something to get from place to place. Now, it is true that often I will give very corny kind of motivations. I will say, uh, oh, then you pull the sword out of the tree and you're going to attack him because you think he seduced your sister. And, you know, the, the corniest possible motivations. And we'll work with that for a while so the actors sort of know what they're doing. Then usually we have to forget that and suppress that because it becomes much too obvious. And I want something much subtler 
much more multifaceted. But there is always underlying these seemingly abstract plays very sort of stupid emotional justification for everything that's happened. Related a little, I suppose, also, as you mentioned, to Eastern theater, because I can see analogies with Japanese theater, certainly, uh, in a certain way with Chinese, with what I know of Chinese theater. I tried, I tried to do it the way I see the Three Penny Opera, or Don Juan, or Wojciech. Now, you know Cocteau, Jean Cocteau once said, if you want to be experimental, just try to be as classical as possible, and then your idiosyncratic nature will show through. So other people, if I can believe them, say, oh, that was a very unusual production of Wojciech. But I am not trying to deconstruct it or to make it like my theater. I am just doing my the collision of my sensibility with Wojciech and trying to serve the text as I understand the text. So I'm trying to think of the play in terms of its historical context, in terms of what I think is the theme of the play. Now, it's true that I may have some lights in the audience's eyes, and they occasionally have a string across the stage, but I'm doing the play as written for what I think are the values in the play. I have never tried to work in the same style uh, that I work with my pecs on another play, because I get to do it in my own plays. And I think my own plays are written specifically to be exploited by my style. I don't think that Moliere or Buchner wrote in a way that is illuminated by the style that I use on my theater. Just as I don't think, you know, I haven't seen that many Adrian Mushkin productions, but uh, Richard III done in the style of Japanese or Chinese theater? Well, okay, but why? I don't know. <laughs>
we all thought of ourselves in that way. After a couple of months, I realized that you know, my work isn't really minimalist. I'm much more of a romantic. Uh, I'm much more complex. But uh, there are elements of minimalism. I still use many repetitive elements, of course, which is a part of minimalism. And I'm still, I'm not pure enough to be a minimalist. As I say, I'm a comic artist. I, Moliere, for me, is the great neck, not Shakespeare. And uh, I'm interested in everything not quite working. And minimalism uh, depends upon cer certain cleanliness of gesture, and scrubbing things down to their basic elements. And so I like the basic structure of minimalism, but I, as an artist myself, I cannot be that pure. I cannot operate with that kind of purity. I operate with mistakes, with messiness, with my own innate sloppiness, and yet <laughs> with a kind of rigor. I'm interested in everything not working, everything being amb ambiguous. So I am a minimalist who then realizes, oh, it's not working. I can't be minimalist enough because look at all this other garbage of the world that is creeping into my minimalism. I named my theater Ontological Hysteric because at the time, when I was just starting, uh, I was running a space for Jonas Mikas, this man who created underground films, and we invited other people to come and use the space. And we invited Austrian theater artist Hermann Nietzsche. I don't know if you know of his work. He did sort of, oh, things based on the Catholic Mass, but it involved lots of dead animals, cutting them up, pouring buckets of blood all over the place, loud noises. He called his theater with a big poster, Orgies Mysteries Theater. I was very impressed, and I thought, oh, I need a name like that. Oh, Orgies, Mysteries, Orgies, Mystery, Ontological Hysteric. Well, that was one of the reasons it occurred to me to have a name. But it was an appropriate name, because I was very interested in the phenomenologists, Heidegger, and so forth, and Heidegger's study of being, and Heidegger's ontological analysis, which means, of course, the isness of things, as opposed to their specific nature, the, the ground of their beingness. And I was always concerned with taking basically very banal psychological situations, such as were the situations in boulevard comedy, bourgeois theater, a trot menage a trois, but redeeming those banal situations, which I thought were hysterical in classical psychoanalytical syndrome. So situations created by people that were suffering from the hysterical syndrome and redeeming them by transforming them, letting ontological considerations and consciousness come and wash them away in a great tidal wave. So it really was ontological, hysteric theater. Now, in the early days, I was very impressed with the idea of a phenomenological analysis where you take something, an apple, and you try to bracket the apple take it away from its normal use in your life and its normal associations in your life, and you try to deal with the essence of your perception of just this object. So my plays were very static, and the people would sit there, move slightly, pick up an object, and there'd be pauses when you were just supposed to be drenched in the phenomenological presence of the essence of the body of the object. After five or six years, as I say, I got bored with that, and I moved on to other philosophical considerations that indeed ended up saying, oh, the object doesn't count for anything. The object could be another object. They're all substitutable. Could be an apple, could be a tree, could be a chair. So it became a different kind of theater. But that was where I started. I always believed that uh, personality was an error, but I certainly did believe in language. I mean, I was at a certain point certainly influenced by contemporary uh, semiotic thought, uh, Saucerian thought that makes language the center of what it is to be human, it makes it the center of the human project. Ever since Freud, I guess, would be talking cure and language through Lacan as a way to access and to, to self-create through language. 
Uh, philosophically, I don't know. Um, the world is changing. You know, I'm very happy to say that at the age of 66, uh, after having read everything, and I think in my work, having anticipated without knowing about a lot of what was going on in continental thought uh, in the uh, 70s, I think my theater sort of anticipated it. And at this point, I'm happy to say, I think I am blissfully confused. I don't know what is happening in the world. I think obviously, with the manifestation of the web and different things, I don't know the place of language anymore. And I don't know if we are moving into the Dark Ages, which I could certainly believe. Uh, I certainly do not like the world I'm living in, but I suspect I probably wouldn't have liked any world I had been living in. I don't know. But I can uh, see that this might be catastrophe. I can also see that things change and maybe possibilities of transcendence and possibilities of another kind of humanity will arise out of this great technological revolution that we're living through. I simply don't know. And I think that my work probably reflects that tension. Hopefully, my work tries to simply play with and embody every impasse, every unresolvable issue that involves human beings trying to be better than they are and human beings always not understanding themselves and not understanding the forces that are moving. I think that is a given, and that's what I work out of, making that present. My life project has been dealing with how we have a consciousness that collides with the world, that wants to be in touch with the ground of being. And if that is not a religious, spiritual concern, ultimately, I don't know what is. That is the real religious concern. What is behind all of this? What underlies all of this? What is operating that we can never know, but is really using us for whatever ends we cannot know? And it is the relationship with that unknown that is the dominant theme of my life. And that's a spiritual, religious concern. I, when I was about 13, I was, not, I'm, I was brought up as a Jew, uh, I say brought up because I discovered when I was 32 I was adopted. And in fact, my father turned out to be a Catholic. Yeah. My biological father, which I never knew when I was 32. But I certainly always thought of myself as a Jew. I was adopted and brought up by a Jewish family. Uh, so, I swore I would never go back into a synagogue when I was like 13. Oh, my blood parents, my mother was a 16-year-old Orthodox Jew. My father was a 17-year-old Catholic Jew. Oh. So obviously there was trouble, you know. Uh, and, uh, but I was brought up in Holy... And I still have to remember that I'm half Catholic. I mean, I always forget. I think of myself as a Jew. And there are many Jewish elements in a lot of my work. Uh, though I always hated official Jewish religion as I was introduced to it in Westchester, New York, and a country uh -huh. club Jewishness. Much to my amazement, about 15 years ago, I was going to do a play in Israel. I went to Israel. I thought I'd hate it. Much to my amazement, I loved it. But, uh, so essentially, I think of myself uh, as a Jew. It's not, for me, it's not only death. It's not life and death. It is this amazing, unknowable energy that, you know, something is at work. And I would like to know what's at work. And there's no way to know. What's making, what's doing all of this? I don't know. But I can't help constantly looking at things that I think might give me a tiny insight into what that unknowable thing is. It never really works. You never really get the insight, really. But I've been spending my whole life searching after things that promise a hint of it, a hint of that knowledge. There are many people inside of us. Inside of us, inside of me, is the Richard who reads Mallarmé and Heidegger and Lacan and uh, Eastern mysticism. And I want to make something that touches those roots. There's another me. There's a nice little uh, middle-class Jewish boy from New York City whose parents wanted him to be a success. And whose parents said, why aren't you writing plays like Neil Simon? Now, that, that's, that little boy is still inside of me along with a lot of other figures. 
So I can't deny that people come to my theater, I make these plays for myself. If the audience starts to fidget a little or look away, I'm in agony. I think, oh my God, they hated it. I don't change it. I don't change it. But maybe subtly, on a subconscious level, after doing this for 35 years, maybe I have been corrupted. I'd like to think not. Now I can compare my own processes. Just last month, I was working on a more commercial project. And as I was working on it, I realized, oh, this really is using a different part of me. And I am thinking about how to keep this going and filling it in a different way so that, I mean, the people I was working with still thought I was doing very strange things, but I knew that I was using a different sector of that multifaceted me that is inside me and inside all of us. So for my own work, I don't think of the audience but maybe I'm lying a little to myself these days after 35 years. And it's very perverse that I'm in the theater with that program, because I will understand that the theater is about something else. It is about appealing to your audience, getting a response from your audience. To me, that's the corruption of the theater. To me, that's the corruption of human life. No, I do not share my own being with the people. Now, maybe I do it without knowing it. I mean, it's for other people to say. But in my own terms, just like uh, Mallarmé, for instance. Nobody could be more unique in his poetry than Mallarmé. He said, no, I'm writing objective poetry. I'm the first objective poet. I am trying on stage to set up these collisions between word, gesture, image, object, and I'm out of it. Now, obviously, there's some kind of idiosyncratic person who decided to do that in the theater as opposed to what most other people are doing in the theater. But I try, in a very funny way, to stay out of it. I'm not aware of putting myself in. A couple of plays I've done have had more personal elements, yes. But I know when that's happening. Well, maybe I was kidding myself. I mean, I think that no artist, no human being, really knows how the world is going to use their effort and how the world is going to interpret their effort. So Lord knows. I can talk a good case, and that is what I'm thinking most of the time, but I'm well aware of the fact that, like most human beings, I'm half fooling myself, perhaps, to a certain extent. Am I happy? Kate, my wife, is convinced that deep down inside, I'm deeply depressed. <laughs> and it may be true, it may be true. But, um, Death is a big element in my work. I think about death a lot. Not scared of it particularly, but, well, no, of course I'm not sure. No. I'm scared of pain, but I don't think I'm scared of nothing. Um, I am, uh, I am, well, like everybody, it's a mixture. I'm frustrated by many things in life. Like every artist in the world, I feel I'm not appreciated. A friend of mine, painter David Sally, who was a big, big painter in the uh, 70s in New York, one of the major painters, I, I always admired him. A couple of years ago, he gave an interview in the article. At the end, the interviewer said, can you name some of the young artists in New York who you think uh, people don't appreciate? And he said, yeah, me. <laughs> I, feel, I feel the same way. <laughs>
most of which I hated. And every year, you know, I'd see 150 shows, 200 shows, maybe three or four I think were really good. They were never what other people liked. Uh, and then I just got to the point where I couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't stand going through all these things that agonized me to sit through. So now I see nothing, practically nothing. Maybe I'll see two shows a year because I have to. A friend is in them. I, I tend to be a hermit. And that's one of the reasons I stay in the theater, because I have that very ambivalent feelings about the theater. But I, if it, with the theater, I must stay in contact with people. And I know that even though I don't like to be in contact with people too much, I know that I need it, and I would dry up. You know, and I would just sleep all day if I wasn't forced to go out and make theater <laughs> and be in contact with people and be turned on by people, even though at the same time, ah, I feel that takes me away from my true self. Well, no, I don't. I certainly wouldn't claim that there aren't people who are smarter than I. And just you know, uh, but I, uh, I don't find it easy to relate to people. I tend to be a hermit. I just, uh, I can be with people. If we go out to dinner or something, it's amusing for an hour, and then I start to feel, oh, we're just exchanging our masks. We're just exchanging our personas, trying to impress each other, trying to be witty, trying to be this, and I begin to get very weary of it that hour, even with people that I respect very much. I think that we are all fallen, divided, terribly fallible people. And after a while, it gets to be too much. I cer I'm certain, including myself, I think it's true of all of us. So, you know, <laughs> that's a kind of bitter vision. vision. Now, my, my theater is comic, but bitter at the same time. confused by what's happening in the world. I think that's perfectly okay. I remember when I was young, thinking I was too articulate. I grew up in a family of lawyers, and I could, I, we would argue around the dinner table every night. And I became very articulate, you know, able to win a lot of arguments. And at a certain point I felt, no, 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 I'm much too articulate. I want to find a way to be much more, ooh, ooh, you know, all over like that, let impulses come through me. And I think in my work, to a certain extent, I have. Oh, I just like thick things that have lots of texture, that very complex, textured, ravishing, beautiful in certain ways. I think I'm a little less romantic now, maybe than I. No, I'm still. I'm pretty romantic. And I like the um, spiritual orientation of the classical romantic authors, both in England and Germany. I, I say I feel underappreciated. In a way, how can I complain? Because partially because I help, but I'm still, you know, I don't have to starve in order to support my theater. I mean, I live, I'm not wealthy, but I have this nice loft and we eat okay, you know. Uh, and I'm able to do for 35 years exactly what I want to do. And there are people around the world who are interested in my work, so I know perfectly well that I have no right to complain. Mm. But. <laughs> I'm not as famous as Bob. <laughs> People are not knocking down the doors to get us to go to festivals. I only have enough money to do one production a year. It's not, you know, and if I didn't have some of my own money, I'm not rich, but my father was a very successful lawyer, and when he died, there's enough money so I don't starve. Uh, and I'm able to work to do my theater. I don't get any money from my theater, and I'm able to make contribution to my theater most years myself. So basically, even though I'm well known and I, I think my work is strong, I've been doing vanity productions for 35 years, the way I look at it. Vanity production. That means productions that you privately, in a way, finance yourself. For years, when I would do operas and things around the world, I was able to put that money into my shows. Uh, now, uh, with some of the money that I inherited, I'm able to put money into my shows and I don't take any salary. That's called a vanity production. Like Proust, 
had to publish the first volume of Remembrance of Things Past by himself. Well, if I didn't have the money that I can put into my theater, essentially funneled through me, I could not do the work I'm doing. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I have enough money to do my shows now, but I'm always worried about the future because I don't get enough funding to do it without my own help, period. What feeds me is the feeling that the truth is told about life. Uh, for me, the truth about life obviously can't be told, but uh, I am aware of a kind of pulsation. Of, it's as if somewhere there's a short radio that is picking up static, picking up foreign stations that are continually feeding through, and they are in, that is informing me at every moment. And I think it's informing everyone. But no, we have to put on blinders and speak only to our conscious end. Now, in order to speak the truth, it's not a question of adding all the things that are not normally being said. It is not a question of me. I used to, I used to pretend, or I used to think, that it was a question of saying, well, I'm talking to you, but I'm also aware of the light. I'm aware of associations from... You know, maybe you remind me of somebody from my past. I'm noticing your dress, the flowers on your dress. I'm noticing his hand moving to adjust the lens. And I guess I would imply in the early days that the texts even had to reflect making reference to a lot of those things. I no longer believe that that's the way that you get to the truth. I believe that all of these other things impinging upon you make kind of different rhythm be quivering inside of you. And the things should not become articulated because the minute they become articulated, like the minute I refer to his hand moving the focus on the camera, that in itself oversimplifies something about just the continual bombardment with atoms that you cannot name. So that it's the rhythm, it's the compositional aspects of my work both the writing and the staging, the, the disruptive rhythms of it that somehow indicate what is really true about being here, now, alive on the earth. So, if that disruptive rhythm can somehow be captured, I find that like a spiritual high, like ecstasy of some sort. So what feeds me is this hunger for that kind of ecstasy that I can only get when all those things are humming in unison. You can't quite say what they are, but you're very clear and lucid about the hum. Oh!